thank you for joining us for today's event. We'll be starting in about five minutes. In the meantime, if you would like access to an assisted listening device or to view live captioning during the event, please ask an usher for assistance. Today's event will be recorded by Twin Cities PBS. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here for a very special program. There are some days when my job is a lot of fun, and, and this day is one of those. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to introduce our two conversants for uh, today. Uh, Tim O'Brien grew up in southern Minnesota, in Austin, and in Worthington. Uh, and he graduated summa cum laude from McAllister College in 1968 with a degree in political science. He was also senior class president. As far as I know, he wasn't the captain of the ultimate Frisbee team. I don't know what else he did, <laughs> but he seems to have done pretty much anything. Uh, this June will mark his 50-year reunion at McAllister. The summer after he graduated, uh, after he went home, he was drafted into the U.S. Army and sent to Vietnam where he served in 1969 and in 1970. 
He is, as you know, the award-winning author of books, including Going After Cacciato, which won the National Book Award for Fiction in 1979, In the Lake of the Woods, which won the James Fenimore Cooper Prize for Historical Fiction in 1995, and The Things They Carried, selected by the New York Times Book Review in 2006 as one of the best American works of fiction in the past 25 years. He is prominently featured in the recent Ken Burns, Lynn Novick documentary, The Vietnam War, and if you haven't watched any of it, uh, I would highly recommend it to you. Uh, the one dissonant note in Tim's biography that I'm still trying to make sense of is that rumor has it that as a senior, he lived in Dupre Hall. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Marlon James is McAllister's writer in residence and associate professor of English, and he has taught here for the last 10 years. Marlon was born in Kingston, Jamaica. He graduated from the University of the West Indies with a degree in language and literature, and then from Wilkes University with a master's in creative writing. Marlon is the author of three acclaimed novels, John Crow's Devil, The Book of Night Women, and a brief history of seven killings, the last of which won the Man Booker Prize in 2015. Marlon and Tim have one telling recognition in common. In 2010, Marlon was awarded the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for the Book of Night Women. The prize recognizes the power of the written word to promote peace. In 2012, Tim was awarded the inaugural Richard Holbrook Lifetime Achievement Award by the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. Uh, I find that overlap and the fact that they are both associated with McAllister moving. I will end uh, my introduction with a recent quote from Tim O'Brien. In this country, we often celebrate the things we've done well, but bury the things we haven't. And because we celebrate in a general way, we celebrate inappropriately. We celebrate the westward expansion of this country, but we rarely discuss the wholesale slaughter of Native Americans. We celebrate militarism, but hardly discuss incidents like Mi Lai. It's about knowing what to question and what to find wrong. Please join me in welcoming Tim O'Brien and Marlon James. kind of fell back down in his chair. How's it going? You're back here again. Here I am. You were here last <laughs> night. Um, actually, you know, I, I want to pick up on, on what Brian was saying, because we were talking about this backstage about history and how, how history is taught, and that you have, you have two kids, growing kids, and they're dealing with American history, how it's taught, how it's sort of mistaught. What do you think, what are we getting wrong? What are we... Well, it's not just what we're getting wrong, mm -hmm. but even what we get, period. Yeah. In the case of Vietnam, because in most high, school, high schools, they'll take the 20th century and go through the whole century mm -hmm. uh, in a semester, Vietnam comes at the tail end, and a good many students go into college uh, not knowing much of anything about their own history, right. the Vietnam part of it. Uh, as I mentioned to you backstage, I often, when I visit colleges, I get the question, who won? Mm -hmm. And I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. I don't mean now and then. I mean pretty often. Yeah. And uh, I get the question, what side were we on? Mm -hmm. North or south? The most basic stuff. Yeah. And then the complications, of course, the, the, the questions don't even occur to them. Mm -hmm. So part of my, what I feel is a responsibility um, and I don't like the responsibility much. I would rather stay home in my underwear and write books. <laughs> but it's, I feel like I feel that it's, edu it's educative. We should know about our own country and our mm -hmm. own history, uh, good and bad both. Mm -hmm. On the celebration aspect, I th which I know you're getting at, yeah. we were also talking backstage about the things that we'll celebrate on, say, the 4th of July or on a Veterans Day or Memorial Day. 
Uh, we, we celebrate things such as sacrifice and have veterans and you know, doing the service to country and so mm -hmm. on. Forgetting that when you're actually in battle, in, in combat, you don't mm -hmm. lie in ambush thinking, I'm going to you know, defeat the communists. Mm -hmm. it doesn't, that question doesn't occur to you. What occurs to you is, how do I stay alive and not be shot in the head? Mm -hmm. And yet, on the 4th of July, the, the, sort of the big words are used. They're yeah. celebrative words where combat is not something you celebrate. No. It's something that uh, infects your dreams and infects your fantasies and your daily life. Uh, but it's certainly not a celebrative thing for most people who are actually doing it. Yeah, but is that something that, um, as a foreigner, I've always realized that something I've found here, that we can only process history two ways. We can either celebrate it or forget it. And there is no third option. There's no like commemorating or recognizing. If we can't celebrate it, we forget it. And, um, and, it, and it plays itself in all sorts of narratives. Like um, People Magazine last week already had a story about the heroes of, of, of Las Vegas. It's like uh, before, and even I remember it was like a week, the heroes of Boston. Mm -hmm. And these people were, you know, I mean, these people were doing heroic things. But mm -hmm. it's like immediately if we can't, if they're in a situation where they simply can't spin it, then they don't talk about, don't talk about it. So, that, so there's no heroes of Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. Is that something that why, why Vietnam remains kind of, of tricky and problematic for people because they can't find an easy way to celebrate anything? Well, I think certain things you one shouldn't celebrate. Right. Uh, killing three million people, I don't think celebration is the right word to use. Mm -hmm. That's how many Vietnamese at the lowest estimate died. Mm -hmm. Vietnamese think it's around six million. Well, what do you do on the 4th of July or Veterans Day? Do you celebrate it? I think it's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I think there's a third way to look at history. The third way to look at history is scab picking, where you, you look at your mistakes. Mm -hmm. You pick the, the scab and you examine just as you would as a human being with your own life. You lie awake and it's 3 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And boy, I wish I didn't say I played high school football. <laughs> I played junior high at that cocktail party I was at, and you dig at yourself thinking, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. We've all been there in various ways in our lives, mm -hmm. and part of what I do when I do my writing is the same thing if, as I would do if I were writing about a family or a father and son relationship. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to get at the scab of, 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 of emotion. Yeah and a rip at it. And I know in your own work you do it, and I know Charlie does it in his work, that mm -hmm. our, our intent is not purely celebrative. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's partly that, yeah. but it's not purely. Yeah. I remember when, um, when you won the, the Richard Hull book, um, um, Rise, the Distinguished Achievement Award, I was there in Dayton with you, and I remember you were very moved that it was a Peace Prize because people, sometimes even with the best intentions, just label you a war writer. And you said then you're not a war writer, you're a peace writer. I want to go into that a little bit. Well, it's you know been that? a lifelong burden in a way that mm -hmm. I, we all, no matter what we write about, Updike is called a suburban writer, Tony mm -hmm. Morrison a black writer, mm -hmm. Roth, Jewish writer. I mean, everybody carried Conrad, an ocean writer, mm -hmm. as ridiculous as that would be. I mean, <laughs> as if he writes about porpoises and, <laughs> and algae, it's ridiculous. And that's the burden we all carry, that kind mm -hmm. of pigeonholing thing. In my own case, I, I've, I've always thought that my books would be a kind of, a, like a, on a package of Chesterfield cigarettes, there's a little uh -huh. warning thing that says, don't smoke these things. And that's what I, that's what I think feel my books are. Uh -huh. uh, that, Death is forever. Killing people is forever. You can't wake them up mm -hmm. if you've made a mistake, if that's the word, or if you've worn blinders. You don't wake up the dead people. Mm -hmm. And too often, not always, but way too often, in my opinion, Vietnam included, we've done, we've smoked the, the Chesterfields, and we shouldn't mm -hmm. have. So I, I do think of myself as a peace writer. Mm -hmm. And for once in my life, the only time when you and I were together, mm -hmm. I really teared up at the word peace because mm -hmm. it's what I've aimed at for 45 years now. Mm -hmm. 
And to have that word associated with my work has meant the world to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's a special prize. I remember um, somebody else, you know, I think she won it after you, and she looked at me once ago and was like, is this for real? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know, that's the I was feeling. Like, yeah, I was like, no, it's for real, and they mean it. Yeah. And they take it, they take it very seriously. It really mattered to them that that peace accord happened in Dayton. Yeah. And, and they take it very, very seriously. I hear in Minneapolis is where I met for the first time a Jamaican Vietnam vet. And I didn't even know there was such a person. And it made me wonder, I don't know if you thought about this, are there stories about Vietnam we haven't heard yet? Are there what? Stories about Vietnam we haven't heard yet. Yeah. yeah. Most veterans of any war, Vietnam included, I think, fundamentally stay silent. Mm -hmm. Even among their children and with their wives or yeah. their business associates and their associates or their neighbors. It, they, we, stall, we fall silent for reasons you may not suspect. They aren't mm -hmm. always psychological. That okay. gets too painful. Yeah. It, part of it is simple politeness, that you don't, among strangers, say, do you want to hear about Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Because most don't. You don't go to a cocktail party or a PTA <laughs> meeting or mm -hmm. you know, hang out with your neighbors at the park and say, you want to hear about Vietnam? And they'll look at you like this, <laughs> with the word no in their eyes. <laughs> but they're too polite uh -huh. to say no, so yeah. you don't do it. Uh, also, there's the whole issue that novelists face, that, mm -hmm. which is, where do you start? And what do you tell? There's a selectivity. Mm -hmm. And when you're asked a question, tell me about Vietnam, mm -hmm. or tell me about warfare, you're overwhelmed by the magnitude of the question. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a writer, you're, over, you're overwhelmed in a specific way, which is the, the specificity of story, mm -hmm. that I'm a believer in the power of story uh, in, a, in, in, in the human life. Mm -hmm. And so when I get a question, I'm trying to find a hook to an anecdote. And right now I'm doing it as I'm yeah. speaking right now, I'm thinking, what anecdote can I come up with <laughs> to illustrate this? But there's a thing called writer's block, and I'm having it right now. So, <laughs> so I can't think of a good story. Yeah. Oh, it's funny, because uh, uh, you know, in my classes, one of the things that my students are facing now is that they just don't know how to, where to begin. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, how did you come across where to begin? Even a story, a, a book like The Things They Carried, where do you begin? Well, for in my case, oftentimes it's language. It's a little mm -hmm. wisp of a phrase or right. a sentence that, where it comes from. Sometimes, you know, from a stranger on a train and mm -hmm. you hear a bit of language. Other times it comes at two o'clock in the morning when you're out, you know, doing the dishes, starting to get ready to work <laughs> for the day. Yeah, an example is one of the best stories I've ever written, in my opinion, uh, begins with just a few words. This is true. So three mm -hmm. words, this is true. and. Uh, the question immediately occurred to me is, what does the word true mean and what does the word this mean? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the this and what is truth? And it intrigued me enough, just as language, to write another sentence, the uh, next sentence. I had a buddy in Vietnam, his name was Bob Kiley, but everybody called him Rat. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as that sentence had been written, it, it's an untrue sentence in the literal sense. I didn't have anybody in Vietnam named Bob mm -hmm. Kiley, nor did anybody call anybody Rat. And that yeah. intrigues a writer because you're playing yeah. with you're playing with the complications of that word truth, yeah. and you're doing it in a context. In my case, of Vietnam, where truth was a that is in most wars a casualty. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, but in, in, the, in the personal sense, the tragedy, mm -hmm. the truth of Tim O'Brien, the guy I thought I had been, yeah. decent, try to be kind to people, polite, uh, was, uh, had vanished in Vietnam for you know, a year of my life. Yeah. And I became a different human being. It was a different truth. Yeah. It, it made me, it's funny, it reminded me of some, a story another Matt grad wrote. Um, it's a nonfiction piece, Patricia Hampel. Mm -hmm. And she has this great essay called Memory and Imagination. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with her getting piano lessons from an old lady. And she couldn't be as good as the other person who's doing, taking piano lessons. And it's almost a third of the way through the essay, she realized well, none of this happened. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I took piano lessons, but there was no cool girl who was better than me. And uh, the piano teacher wasn't that severe as, as she remembered. And then the whole essay then becomes, um, what, what is, where is memory and an imagination beginning? What is the work imagination doing? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're dealing with a lot of memory. And it made me think about you and about how to tell a true war story and so on. Right. What, what is, where does that line hit with you and how do, how, do, how do each work together for you? Well, for me, they go, they blend back and forth. Sometimes yeah. imagination replaces memory for mm -hmm. me. When I think now back, and Vietnam was half a century ago for me. That's a long time. And, my, and when I, the word Vietnam comes into my head, or, the, or, or I watch a, a, a film like the Burns film, mm -hmm. my, my made-up stories have replaced a good deal of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. That because I think in words, as I'm sure you do most yeah. of the time, the words that I've written have, are associated with behaviors, with events, with things that occur in the world, with how people speak, um, the, how they comport themselves. And in a subtle way, imagination is replaced where my memory erodes, it, yeah, it yeah. fades, it goes away. When I think of, of Austin, Minnesota, where I was born, there's not much memory there. There's a little. Yeah. But when I write a story about childhood, somehow it fills in imaginatively the feel mm -hmm. of what it was to grow up a scared little kid moving out of a house on North 4th Street. My mm -hmm. mom had a nervous breakdown and was uh, uh, taken to the Mayo Clinic where she spent, a, I don't know, several months. Mm -hmm. And I had to leave my house as a maybe kindergarten, somewhere yeah. in there. Well, I don't remember much, except I remember the numbers 805 on the front door. 805 was the address. And that little detail has lasted. And through mm -hmm. fiction, through writing a story, I can try to get at, through make-believe, through invention, mm -hmm. the feel of being a little kid whose mother has vanished, and now you're leaving your own house, and you feel this sense of emptiness and loss of anything that tied you to, to what you thought was your life. It's yeah. gone now. And it works the other way, of course, that you know, memory, of course, also influences with the things we imagine. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interpenetrative process, I think. They, yeah. One feeds the other. Mm -hmm. You think also with writing, because I was, I was looking at an, an old interview with you, and you were, we were talking about um, Linda at the end of Things They Carried. And um, the soldier, who I'm, um, is it Grunt, who stands on a, hits the landmine. Mm -hmm. And one thing you, I think you mentioned about both of those characters is that they kind of end up suspended in a kind of present tense. Mm -hmm. and I want to if, if that's also something that's important to you, that these characters kind of remain in that spot, and fiction can do that. Yeah, I think yeah. that's true. Yeah. I think all, all novelists, I mean, I, well, you can't generalize, but mm -hmm. I would guess that most of yeah, us do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think most of us do. <laughs> we, we imagine our characters forever what they are. Mm -hmm. um, that the examples you gave of a character named Kurt Lemon, uh, who he will forever be mush up in a tree. Mm -hmm. Blown into a tree, yeah. and then he'll get reblown into the tree. He'll get reblown, and for every for every time anybody opens a book, there's Huckleberry Finn, mm -hmm. by and by, and you're tiptoeing down the path to the river, mm -hmm. and it's 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 a it's. I'm not sure frozen is quite the right word, but it's close to yeah. the right word. Their the characters move. Ahab is mobile in my memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, Huck is mobile in my memory, but it's mobile within the yeah. confines of the book, and that's it. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I always have mixed feelings about sequels. Like, I don't want Huck I don't want an adult Huckleberry Finn. It's like you I'm can collaborate, <laughs> <laughs> write our own. I wouldn't want to do it either. Although Coover just did it, Huck, go, Huck, Huck Out West. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious because the this is not a question I know you've talked about before, um, but you know, I got students, they want to know. Um, when we talk, because you, you read a lot about war, and, 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 and I read quite a bit about violence and terrible things people do to people. Mm -hmm. And they always wonder, um, how do you get in the frame of mind to write 
um, suffering or pain and anguish, and is it also, do you also kind of suffer when you write this or relive these things or bring your imagination to it? It's almost exactly the reverse. Yeah. That I'm, I'm most giddy in my heart when I'm feeling that a librarian in Sioux City will have her stomach turned mm -hmm. by, the, <laughs> by the shooting of a baby water buffalo. Uh -huh. And it's elating because that's the least of mm -hmm. war, you know, shooting mm -hmm. dead animals. I mean, and there, people are getting shot. And there's, a, there's an endorphin rush that, that goes through me at macabre and grim, sorrowful moments of books mm -hmm. that, that this is going to hurt. Mm -hmm. And they're going to feel something of what I felt 45 years ago, not just in war, but in my personal life as mm -hmm. well. Love and dealing with fathers and mothers and uh, little Minnesota small towns. And <laughs> they're going to feel something of what it felt like. Mm -hmm. That uh, if, if it were not for that, I'm sure I would be a nonfiction writer. Mm -hmm. uh, just holding up a mirror to the world and you know, trying to reflect what is. But it, it, without fiction, I don't think that, that that sense of putting a person in a place and, and so you feel what the, the character is feeling. Yeah. And uh, fiction is a great way to go about it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am. Um, so, you know, I met you and I met um, Larry Heinemann and Ron Kovic and I met quite a few of the, the, the Vietnam vet writers, mm -hmm. and one of the things that a lot of them have in common is a certain, maybe not now, but certainly in a, in a, in a few years, this sort of profound disillusionment with America mm -hmm. and, and what it's, it claims it stands for. And I wondered, because you've probably met quite a few, if, if, how is this different from, say, running into the Iraq vet? Because one of the things I, 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 um, I think I noticed with some of my friends who went to Iraq, is that the certainty they had in America before they left, they come back and they still have it. Whereas I don't know a Vietnam vet who do, did. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I know few, not yeah. many, very few. Um, well, we're, we're, we were different people when we went. Mm -hmm. uh, I was drafted and today people sign up voluntarily. Right, right. So it's a different cat who's going to war in the first place, carrying a different set of values, mm -hmm. a different family history. Um, but in my era, most of the people I served with were draftees. I think 75 percent, somewhere mm -hmm. in that era or that area, maybe 65 yeah. percent, um, who went reluctantly, who went, who went essentially for the reason I went. They were too afraid to say no. And by afraid, I don't mean physically. I mean you don't want to have people in your hometown thinking you're a coward and a sissy and a traitor and mm -hmm. by going to Canada or to jail. And you're too, you're, you're, you feel you would be uh, embarrassed and your family would be embarrassed if you were to say, no, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. So there was a pressure put on us that th those who didn't believe in the war, mm -hmm. in fact, thought it was an immoral and unwinnable war, both combined, and they, th those feed each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, but today, you, you, if you don't want to go to a war, you just don't have to go. You just don't join the Marine Corps or the mm -hmm. Army and you don't go. And your mom and dad don't have to worry about you dying. Mm -hmm. And if you have children, they don't have to worry about it. And so it's a different kind of person that goes. Mm -hmm. I got to say also, though, that now I receive far more letters and mm. messages from uh, veterans of our current wars, Iraq really? and Afghanistan, and from the children and the wives and the parents. What, what are them. they telling you? What are they? They all say the same thing, essentially. Mm -hmm. My son, daughter, husband stays silent. He won't talk about it, mm -hmm. can't talk about it, or some combination of those two. Mm -hmm. And now, having read your book, at least I know something of what they're, they went through and what they're going through right now, yeah. the, bur the burdens they're carrying. And that it's mm -hmm. like, I feel like, feel like it's reaching across a generation, sort mm -hmm. of going from 50 years and putting a hand out. Mm -hmm. And I, I just got, day before yesterday, I got this coolest email that, that can possibly arrive for any writer. <laughs> There's a guy who looks like Osama bin Laden. He's a Green Beret on, in uh, Hindu Kush. Mm -hmm. 
wearing the, you know, the, 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 the hat and uh, yeah. got a beard that's a big black beard and he's sitting on a rock and the hills and mountains are behind him and he's reading things they carried in the picture. And it pops up on my computer <laughs> and it's like being re visited partly by Al-Qaeda because mm -hmm. the guy looks like he's, uh, you know, he looks, mm -hmm. he, except for his boots, which are plainly American boots, he looks as if he could be a member of the, uh, the you know, the, the enemy, mm -hmm. uh, reading a, a book. Uh, over there. Things like that, I think, is partly what literature is f for. Mm -hmm. It's for connecting the world of, say, Jamaica mm -hmm. that you remember with a world of America and with a world way out in the future that has nothing to do with either place. It has mm -hmm. to do with humanity. And uh, no matter what your subject is, it could be, you know, a divorce story, mm -hmm. um, whatever that might be. You have to go beyond that, obviously, to be a good story. Mm -hmm. But, it would, <laughs> but it, would, it would be connective to things we all care about, love mm -hmm. and loss, uh, how we change ourselves, our own values change, and issues of truth and falsity. Mm -hmm. uh, if one day one can say to somebody, say, at McAllister College in 2017, I love you. You may not three weeks later or 30 years later be able to utter truthfully those same three words, mm -hmm. I love you. Truth changes over time for all of us. Yeah. I used to believe in the Easter Bunny, I don't anymore, but it was true then. You're kind of ruining Truer some, than, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're ruining some lives right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, wreck, I'm wrecking Marlon's illusions about. <laughs> don't, don't come for Santa Claus. <laughs> right. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, I want uh, another, we were talking about writing, another writer question, because um, he's been dead 200 years, so he can't answer it, but you've, you're a writer and you've written about war and conflict. One of the things I have always noticed is that when Stendhal, the writer, writes a war scene, he cuts the sound. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he does, did that? Why do you think he does that? I think for two reasons. One, yeah. verisimilitude, I think, is part of it, and mm -hmm. I think part of it is to has to do with what I was talking about a little bit earlier about making, there's something about inside the chest of a human being that when you're reading literature, seeing a movie or viewing art of any sort, it feels like there's a uh, cello, I want to say, but there's mm -hmm. these, these chords, maybe it's a bass, and something vibrates mm -hmm. inside me when I'm reading that doesn't have to do necessarily with rationality. Right. It has to do with some vibration of language, of imagery, of imagination, mm -hmm. of fantasy, uh, of that late night feeling when you slip into sleep. And it's the unus of the reader, the, the individuality of the reader is made to vibrate. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with those two in, in, in combination. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm reading a book, I don't just intellectually respond to it. I'm sure you, you probably don't either. No. You, you respond in all kinds of ways to a mm -hmm. book and to any art, your heart and your back of your throat and mm -hmm. nape of your neck and your, your stomach responds. Yeah. There's a physical response to it, partly intellectual, but not entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted part of it too is um, if, you're in a, if you're in a battlefield, hearing is the first thing to go. You know, and if you want, and he wanted people to sort of capture that. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to get the immediacy, immediacy of all that noise, well, the first thing you lose is sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, first yeah. thing you'd lose. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, yeah, but it's it's, um, it's a crafting. I was like, damn it, I never thought about that. But <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, my s s students will freak out if I don't ask a student question. So I'm going to ask a student question. <laughs> Notice how they just yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this one, how did your experience in Macalester inform your time in Vietnam? I think the person who wrote that one just said something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the truthful answer, as far as I know, truth is I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Like, you can only speculate about stuff like that. Um, I, I've, I've, images of McAllister that immediately preceded Vietnam. One of them is standing out on Grand Avenue in a peace vigil, just standing there, which mm -hmm. was my first and one of my few uh, public acts of opposition to the war. There were mm -hmm. others, but they were few. 
I tried to do my response through my writing, by and large. And I remember the feel of people at McAllister looking at me funny, mm -hmm. disapproving. One has to remember the era. It was, you know, mm -hmm. Anti-communism was the orthodoxy that prevailed during the time. It put it was blinders. much America's religion, anti-communism. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. And, it put, and, and because it was a religion and because it was an orthodoxy, it established blinders, the blinders to, for in the case of Vietnam, mm -hmm. the desire for independence on the part of a, of a country that wanted to rule itself, and a country that for decades had been under French colonialist rule. And if you watch the Burns documentary or if you read any history, it was so resented. Mm -hmm. The French were hated by the Vietnamese, almost top to bottom. There was a top level, that maybe hatred's not the, the, mm -hmm. not the word, they were the high level functionaries that worked under the French who were privileged, mm -hmm. but by and large, uh, the, the French were despised. And they wanted to, sh they, when they threw off the shackles after World War II, they wanted them permanently. They wanted to run their own country the same mm -hmm. way we'd want to run it. We wouldn't want ISIS to come over here and say, you're gonna have a theocracy. You'd say, get out of, get out. We don't want that any more than we have a right to say you can't have a theocracy, by the way. Mm -hmm. We're all allowed to, you know, I hope as, in, as uh, uh, nations to decide what, what it is we want through whatever means we use. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you, you heard for the first time some passion come into my voice. I get mm -hmm. angry at certain things. And mm -hmm. when you ask about McAllister, a little, anger comes in at me at those mm -hmm. looks I was getting of, of disapproval. Mm -hmm. um, but it, was, it, it came out of this orthodoxy thing. Yeah. But I have incredible memories of, of the education I got here. I, I, I knew, thanks to Prof. Mitow and Green and all the terrific professors I had here, including in philosophy and mm -hmm. in English, was Bob Ward your professor or was your, yeah? I knew Bob Ward, but only mm -hmm. after I graduated. I, mm -hmm. I, he was one of the terrific teachers. You, yeah. know, you know him too. Yeah. I hope, maybe he's here. I don't know. He's I hope here. So. He left and he came back for a few years. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh. So he's left now for good? For good. Oh, that's too bad. Until we ask him to come back again. I hope he comes back. <laughs> Great teacher. Yeah. And so, so the, McAllister was... I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting here with you if it weren't mm. for McAllister. Mm -hmm. I'd be sitting at Hamlin and no... <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> hey, their writing program is pretty good. Um, so another question from Max student. Um, in what ways can fiction and creative expression contribute to recovery from the experience of war? Because when, when, I, when I read it, the first thing I thought of was that line about Tim saving Timmy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think stories in the end for me are about saving life, not just, mm -hmm. not in a physical sense, right. of course, but it's preserving that which is enduring and forever, or if it's not, should be. Mm -hmm. There are two different things. And in the end, we, what, uh, uh, when, when, I, when I die, I'm going to be my last, if I, could, if I could force my last wish on myself, which you can't do, it would be something like you did your best to express your uncertainty and ambivalence and, uh, mis and uh, error in the world. Mm -hmm. That the last thing I want to do is pretend even to myself that I know anything. Mm -hmm. I feel like a little kid inside most of the time. And it's an uncertainty, but it's a response to absolutism. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes me mm -hmm. more angry than I know and you don't. Yeah. I'm right and you're wrong. Or I don't know and I don't care. And I, or I don't know <laughs> and I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. The absolutism in, in, on, on the global level, international mm -hmm. level, but also on, I think on the personal level, is one of the, th it kills me. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my resentment of the town I grew up in. It was full of absolutists. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not all of them. I don't mean everybody in Worthington, Minnesota, but mm -hmm. I mean a lot of them. Mm -hmm. the, 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 
guy on the golf course who will say, oh, we ought to go, you know, nuke Hanoi mm -hmm. and nuke it. We, that kind of rhetoric I'm actually hearing kind of today. It's not Hanoi anymore. It's someplace else, but mm -hmm. you kind of hear it. And they're so sure about it, they're willing to kill a bunch of people. And by bunch, I mean millions. Mm -hmm. How could anybody be so sure? Mm -hmm. I'm wearing this white shirt that's got a little, my wife got it for me to JC Penney's in Austin, Texas, where I live now. Mm -hmm. I'm on this absolutism thing. <laughs> well, you know where I'm going. There's a little tag in the back, and you know what it says, right? It says, made in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well. That war was sold to us, as all wars in one way or another are, as a pending catastrophe. Mm -hmm. That if we don't go kill people, horrible things will ensue. Mm -hmm. Dominoes will fall, the communists will land on the streets of San mm -hmm. Francisco and Seattle, and they'll find their way to Minneapolis, and mm -hmm. we'll lose all our liberties. Well, 45 years later, after the worst possible outcome, we mm -hmm. lost. Mm -hmm. They control the real estate, they're still in power, the communist won. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be a worse outcome. But who among us, including myself, mm -hmm. wakes up saying, oh dear Jesus, we lost the war, what a nightmare my life is. Mm -hmm. I've lost all my <laughs> liberties. Yeah. The dominoes have fallen. They mm -hmm. fell, they fell fascist for the most part, exactly the reverse. Mm -hmm. Exactly, excluding Laos. Yeah. It's, it's, what, what, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, but there was an absolutism, three million yeah. dead people, and nobody gives a shit. Yeah. There was they don't even know if they won or lost. Yeah. And nobody wakes up thinking, oh, what a catastrophe, what a catastrophe, and that there's all these dead people. And, and then all, you don't, it's not just the dead people, it's the mothers and fathers of the dead mm -hmm. people and the children of the dead people. Mm -hmm. There was a catastrophe, all right, but the catastrophe was the war itself. You got me on something I had to respond to. Totally. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, you know, is, is uh, watching the documentary, the thing that struck me, one of the things that struck me, because it applies, it applies to Jamaica and to, to the Caribbean and, and in, in a lot of ways is just how how we talk about absolutism being a how much anti communism was a religion and how much the Cold War shaped everything. Because mm -hmm. when I was growing up I had the Cold War coloring book. And I'm eight years old and there's a book and the book on one side it has this is a democracy and they show things like an ice cream truck and all these <laughs> things on the side and you're supposed to paint it in these rainbow colors. And then this side is a totalitarian, of course I didn't even know how to spell that, it's it had total in it. And it was this drab thing and the line going on for miles and everybody can only one scoop of ice cream, not four. And all of that. <laughs> and it's the, the and in, right in the book I wrote, just seeing the, the damage that was caused in Jamaica, in Ecuador, in, in Latin America, in, in the Congo, in all these things, mm -hmm. fighting this war because of this ridiculous red threat. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of these places, you know, the, 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 the anti-communist side or whatever didn't even win. Mm -hmm. And now we're here going, well, what was it, you know, what was it kind of all, what was it kind of all for? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it goes back to again, I'm amazed, and not just as a person, well, I'm amazed as a writer that people can get certainty. Because I don't know if writers ever get that. I if, we're, if we're gonna get it. I don't. Yeah. I mean, there's things I believe in, mm -hmm. but even the things I believe in, I almost always qualify. Right, there right. Are things, oh, well, that would I, I, I believe it's nice, it's good to be polite to people. But there are occasions when I intentionally and willfully and, and with some delight, I'm not polite to people. <laughs> and some of those occasions are political, but others mm -hmm. are not. Others are, are bullyism, for example. Right. I, I, I'm not gonna be polite. I mean, I be the opposite of, what, of polite. I got some fights I needed to fight for me. I'm just saying. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, writer question again, because um, I saw somewhere that you said you write every day. Please explain this to my writing students. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't believe me that oh, they're writing every day thing. Oh, God. 
<laughs> it's even worse than that now. <laughs> now that, now that I've, I'm now 71 years old, and uh, Hemingway has this line, uh, why, why is it that old men wake so early? Is mm -hmm. it to have one longer day? Well, I'm now getting up at yeah. 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and See, kind of working sleep. every day until roughly 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I take a little break then and, and then uh, take a nap for a couple of hours and then try to work a little more in the afternoon, maybe an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And it's regular. Joseph Conrad has this terrific line in his, one of his letters where he says, my wife puts me in a room, and I'm mm. paraphrasing. Yeah. I, part of it I'm not going to paraphrase, but and I, she closes the door, and I sit there all, all day. And he said, the sitting down is all. Isn't that a great phrase? Mm -hmm. You don't do what we do or what, by, when you go bowling. You don't write novels when you're, I don't know, doing, uh, I don't know, anything else but sitting mm -hmm. down. And for me, and I, I would guess for you, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a regularity that is, for, at least for me, is necessary. Yeah. If I do it on Thursday and then pick it up next Sunday mm -hmm. and then do it two days in a row and skip a week, it's as if I'm awakening from a dream, yeah. and then trying to get back into the dream, and then awakening and back into it. Yeah. That yeah. without that sense of regularity of dreaming it, mm -hmm. and, and it's the first few minutes are, oh God, I don't want to sit down again, and you do <laughs> it. And within a few minutes, yeah. the, the, sto the story is like a magnet, kind of mm -hmm. draws me in, but it's not just story, it's, the words on the paper. Mm. See, I'm, I'm always scared of, of not writing every day because I feel if I, if I take two, three days, even a week, it become, the story becomes stale to me. It's like trying to cap, get back into a dream. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you, know, you try to daydream your way back into a dream, it doesn't really work. It doesn't work. Yeah. That's I, for me. Yeah, I just, that's the reason why, because I will get bored. I have, you know, there, there are novels that I've started and say I take a month off and they remain in that drawer for 10, 15 years because yeah. I, just, I just can't get it back. Yeah, you know, I'm like, with you. Yeah, it's sort of staying in that, you know, John Gardner talking about that vivid, continuous dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're gonna stop, then it stops being continuous. So, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Sometimes you wish you were a poet where you could just get it done in an hour. Just kidding. <laughs> Them's fighting words. I'm kidding, poets. <laughs> yes, because they will, they will come for you. <laughs> um, student question. How and when did you begin writing about your military service? How early? How and when? I guess the same thing. I began in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I began, uh, oh, God, the second or third month there. There was an hour of the day that... that was sacred to all of us. Mm -hmm. It was when the day was coming to an end. Typical day was you'd go from village to village and through rice paddies, sometimes up into the jungles and the mountains, but largely in the paddy land. Stepping on mines and scared to death, quick little vicious firefights. They'd be over mm -hmm. in 10 minutes or 20 minutes, then you'd fly out your casualties and you'd plod around, never having any sense of destination or why you're doing what you're doing, even mm -hmm. in a even in a military sense, yeah. we had no idea like why we're going there and not there. Mm -hmm. And our officers didn't know either. And then the day finally comes to an end and there's an hour of twilight from in Vietnam. It was roughly between maybe 7.30 and uh, I don't know, 8.30 at night, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. You dig a foxhole on, a, on high ground and you'd sit down to wait for night, which was also an active time in combat. Mm -hmm. the, one man would be on guard at a foxhole while the other slept and you'd switch off every two hours. So you'd be awake half the night. But as the hour of twilight fell, it got darker. Most guys would horse around and mm -hmm. talk about their hometowns and what they do when the war was over and their girlfriends and cars and all that stuff. And there was, uh, but for me, that was a time of, you could just sort of catch your breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't yet 
black, dark, so it wasn't yet spooky and dangerous, which it was going to become. And you were through with the, the at least the walking part. And yeah. the walking part was dangerous because of all the landmines. Mm -hmm. Just the walking was terrifying. Forget the firefights, forget the ambushes, the patrols. For, just walking was scary. So you're, so you're not walking anymore, dark is coming on, and I would sit at my foxhole every fourth, fifth night. Mm -hmm. And while the other guys are joking, and I just write little one-page vignettes. Little they, right weren't, they, what? they weren't even, <laughs> yeah, we had these little pads of USO paper they gave mm -hmm. us. They'd fly this stuff out to write letters on, basically, oh. to home. So I'd use that stuff. And it, it wouldn't be much, it would be a few sentences maybe a page or a page and a half about whatever had struck me mm -hmm. during the day. Um, so it was nonfiction in a sense, but I could feel as you write sentences, it, it stops being nonfiction because you're putting language around it. Mm -hmm. So if you write a guy's name, Ted did, you know, got blown away today, you realize, well, got blown away today. What? That's a cliche, and it's not very meaningful. So you try you mean to a change, literary critic you change in the your trenches. words. Yeah. <laughs> so you you'd, so you insert a, a, a detail of precision mm -hmm. to make yourself kind of remember and feel. Yeah. I can't say it was. I was doing art. I wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. I was. I was trying to express mainly for my mom and dad mm -hmm. that. It, I, I imagined my bot being dead, my body being found, and I wanted some record of what I'd gone through, found yep. on my person. So my mom and dad would know something of what I had gone through, even if it were poorly written. Mm -hmm. At least it would be written. And uh, by the time I left Vietnam, I'd accumulated, uh, I don't know, 40 scribbled on pages, the equivalent mm -hmm. of type of maybe four or five pages in type, if mm -hmm. that, not much. Uh, and so I had that and I carried it in my rucksack and when the war was over and I got to come home, it was almost all illegible. The, I mean, yeah. the monsoons, it was wet, the paper mm -hmm. was all crumpled, but there were scraps of stuff that I, yeah. I had. And then I had written letters to my parents and I had some of that that I'd uh, done. But it was the act of writing about, it, 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 there was an immediacy to the prose, as bad as the prose was, mm -hmm. it did, have the immediacy of happeningness. I yeah. feel it even, the, the, well, it was a start. Yeah. How important is that, the sort of immediacy of writing what you're writing about? Well, I need to feel it in fiction. I need mm -hmm. to feel immediacy all around me. Even if it was something that's 40 years ago. It could be, have been written in, uh, by Homer, but if it mm -hmm. doesn't feel immediate, I'm going to say, that sucks, try again. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He, whoever, who, Whoever Homer was, which is you know, extremely unclear, and I believe it was a, more or less a collection of older mm -hmm. stories that someone finally eventually put down in one form or another, eventually in the early form oral. Uh, but th there is an immediacy to Hector and Achilles at, mm -hmm. at the gates of Troy that I mean, is just as compelling now as I think it would have been before. And I think, well, I, I can't believe most novelists don't and story mm -hmm. writers don't strive for that sense of it's, it's happening before your eyes, and you're, you're almost in the happening as a yeah. reader. In a way, I don't feel it a movie. I feel the movie is happening on the screen, and I'm watching. But in a book, something about the engagement of the human being, the mind mm -hmm. translating, deciphering the, those letters on the page, you're making pictures in your head, mm -hmm. and it's not Hollywood flashing them on a screen. The reader's doing it. Mm -hmm. And then so there, and that has an that if, if it's artfully done, it has an immediacy that's so compelling. Um, it just takes my breath away when I yeah. read things that do that to me. So that's my theory about bad literature. That bad literature, your bad literature doesn't make your brain do any work. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. You know, like like a novel that shall remain nameless, Twilight. Um, <laughs> had a, you know. <laughs> There's a scene in, in it where, where the character says, he looked like a rock star. And I'm like, at a certain age, that might be Jim Morrison. At a certain age, that might be somebody who just an American Idol. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's a, it, this sort of um, choose your adventure approach to writing a book. Yeah. I was like, I'd rather have a Twilight coloring book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
so I can do all the, 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 you know, the imaginative work um, myself. What do you find yourself writing these days? It's a sore subject in a way. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent the last 14 years doing uh, pretty much nothing, mm -hmm. but in, by intent that I am a late blooming father. I got mm. these two kids, and uh, when the first was born in the year 2003, I vowed that I was gonna be a good father, mm -hmm. no matter what the price, mm -hmm. and I didn't care what it was, and I still don't, that you, you have to, I mean, I didn't wanna be a bad dad. Mm -hmm. And if, the one thing that a father cannot be is you cannot be absent. Mm -hmm. You gotta be present, you gotta be there. Mm -hmm. And fairness means wholehearted thereness. Yeah. I could have been there in an absent-minded, distracted kind of way, but mm -hmm. I wanted to be there. I didn't stop writing. Right. I would every now and then, I would sustain what I was doing. I wouldn't leave what I was doing, this mm -hmm. dream thing. Mm -hmm. But they were real short little passages that I would, five, eight, ten pages, that I could do in a day or two. And over the course of uh, 14 years, I accumulated a lot of these pages. They're mm -hmm. all, they coalesce around one subject, uh, which has to do with fatherhood and, mm -hmm. and death. Mm -hmm. That uh, when you're 71 years old and you've got a 12-year-old kid, You don't have to be a mathematician to figure out you're not going to be around when the kid's 26 or mm -hmm. 27. The odds are extremely slim. Mm -hmm. And I'm a smoker, so they're slimmer. <laughs> and that presses on you the same way that mm -hmm. NOM pressed on me, or the yeah. tuberculosis might, or mm -hmm. you know, heart disease, or all the... Mm -hmm. we, all, we all end up in one place. We all end up, you know, dead. Yeah. But in the case of two little kids, there's a, there's a sadness that accompanies it, that it's not me I'm so worried about, it's, mm. you know, where's my daddy? Yeah. But I was... So, just to, to finish, the, so yeah. the, what I'm trying to write about is to give them, not, not just the gift of their father as much as I can, mm -hmm. through these little anecdotal things, but to give them their own childhoods. Mm -hmm. Because I've erased almost everything from the time I was born to coming to Mac, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. it's high school's there, sort of, but anything prior to high school is high really school can gone. Go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably good, right? For yeah. yeah. So you I want to remind back. the kids of what they, uh, of the things they said and did. Mm -hmm. Strange, weird, ugly, and endearing. Oh, the whole, and, and just give them just a little pinches of their childhood as they grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I also, regardless of age, I always think it's a good thing for writers to feel they're running out of time. Yeah. It, 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 it just slaps an urgency, and I think you should have an urgency yeah. when you write as well. I like think you, you should. should. Yeah. I think you have to. <laughs> Um, we're, that, that was not me trying to be cute about running out of time because we have a little time left. Um, ask some more student questions or else they will kill me and not take my class. Um, <laughs> how would you describe the bonds between fellow soldiers in Vietnam War, between rank and file, superior officers? How did I feel about the dynamic? Yeah, the and how you just, yeah. Oh God, that's, that's, this is an embarrassing to answer. I mean, hmm. If you're an officer, I hated you. <laughs> I, uh, it's like, I mean, who wants to salute their inferiors? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it's just ass backwards. Uh -huh. um, so my company commander, a guy named, uh, I better not use his real name. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure. trying to remember what I called him, and if I die, Billy something or others. Mm -hmm. but, man, no, I didn't. I called him Bobby. His real name was Billy. No, he's from Tennessee, a roly-poly, ROTC officer, mm -hmm. captain, took over our company. Couldn't read a map. Mm -hmm. I was his RTO, meaning I carried his radio, so I had to sleep with this guy, like right beside me. Now, I don't mean... He was, <laughs> <laughs> he was there and I was over here. So mm -hmm. there's a cord that connects we don't, us. We don't judge. Yeah. Hands, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> a new era. 
And one night, I remember I was sound asleep. We're at the, we're at the center of a perimeter, because he's the CEO, he's the captain in charge. And, the, and we were in a village, and everybody else in the company, about 100 guys are spread out on the outskirts of this village. And right next to me at the 3 in the morning, blah, 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 this loud explosion is in my ear. I jerk away my heart, you know, jump it out of my chest. And it was Billy a, killing a pig in the middle of a perimeter. In other words, those bullets he's shooting at the pig could have killed our own men. I mean, stupidity. Uh, another day, there's Billy pointing at the sky up there, and he'd, he'd gotten lost, as usual. And, <laughs> and he called it into artillery for a marking round. That, that a marking round was an artillery round that would explode at a certain grid coordinate up in the sky. And from where it exploded, you could look at a map and you could tell where you were in, on the ground. And he said, oh, Timmy boy. I was just, call me Timmy boy. That, that, I resented that, too, the boy part. <laughs> Timmy boy, that round's going to explode right over there. Boom, directly 180 degrees the other way. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wasted lives. He'd send us into tunnels, you know, to crawl down into tunnels. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was worthless. I mean, you'd, you'd nev you'd, you never found anything except landmines. You'd, it'll blow you up. Mm -hmm. And the alternative that all the, all the decent officers would do would have you throw in hand grenades and you'd blow them up. You'd, there was nothing worth finding in these things, we learned historically. We didn't find mm -hmm. documents. We didn't find weapons. We found landmines. The guy was eventually relieved. This is not just my opinion of this guy. The, the, <laughs> he was relieved of duty. His, his own lieutenants didn't like him. Um, so the dynamic was I, I was, I was kidding about hating officers. Mm -hmm. Certain ones, when they're in charge of human life and waste it, out of stupidity, out of false bravado, out of machoism, out of I want to have a good adventure here in Vietnam, therefore mm -hmm. we're going to do these dangerous, bad things that yeah. were unnecessary and didn't do. Um, there was a mentality on the part of some officers, because they were in charge, they'd made us do things that we thought were, were not, were just, would, would actually help lose the war. Mm -hmm. The officers who were good were so good. They, did, mm -hmm. they, they would not squander life unnecessarily. Oftentimes at night, uh, this is a, like, in one example, that we would fake ambushes. We wouldn't do them. We'd stay on our, at our perimeter up on a hill somewhere, and the company commander would say, we're not going out on an ambush tonight, mm -hmm. but we're going to pretend we are. And it was my job as an RTO and a budding novelist to get to lie, as novelists do for a living. And I'd get on the radio, and in a hush-hush voice, I'd say, we're at whatever the, we, the, our grid coordinates were encoded. And mm -hmm. so I'd make up a spot on the map where we were supposed to be, and I'd call in the grid. And then every hour, you'd do a thing that called calling in a sit rep, a situation report. And I'd, in a scared, hushed voice, I'd say, you know, sit rep negative mm -hmm. as quietly as I could. And the whole thing was make-believe. We cherished officers who did that. It's not that we never went out on ambushes. Mm -hmm. It's just every seventh time, you say, you're not going to die tonight. I'm not going to let you die tonight. And it makes me want to cry mm -hmm. thinking about that guy who's risking, you know, this guy, most of these guys were lifers or at least thinking about being lifers. Mm -hmm. They're risking career. They're risking, you know, getting demoted. They were even risking, in some cases, being put in jail. You know, that, that mm -hmm. you get an, you, this is a, an offense in the military. Mm -hmm. But we just, these guys were beloved. And, and because of the kind of war it was that uh, no one ever thought about, we're going to win this thing. That was out of the question by the time I got there in 1969. Mm -hmm. Winning didn't cross our minds, and at least in my unit. It was stay alive mm -hmm. and try not to, uh, Try not to kill anybody on the way if you can possibly help it. Don't try to invite anybody. I mean, don't. You hope the enemy won't attack you, so you won't have to kill them, mm -hmm. or even or try. Uh, and, and so officers who just had sort of common sense and a, a, a decency that was, even if it was residual decency that was inside these people, they were beloved. Mm -hmm. uh, many of my fellow. Uh, grunts in my company, whom I've met since, have named their children, their sons, after 
some of these better oh, cool. officers, yeah. and, and uh, they're that beloved. Mm. Okay, cool. It was a complicated dynamic. Yeah. All right, well, we are out of time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank yep. Tim O'Brien. Thank you. Coming. I want, I want to uh, reiterate thanks to Tim, thanks to Marlon. Uh, just to let all of you know, uh, for those uh, acquaintances of yours who couldn't be here, uh, the conversation will probably within a couple of days uh, be up and viewable on the McAllister website. So uh, please recommend it to your friends. Thanks so much for being here.